Joy in the house today. I see joy in the house today. Come on. I see the presence of God just filling this place. Wow. Well, welcome to Sunday Morning Church. I hope you all are doing well today. Um, if this is your first time here, would you just simply raise your hand? We'd love to connect with you. If this is your very first time to Capital City, welcome, welcome, welcome. We see you. We see you. Welcome. Welcome. So glad to have you all here with us today. Um, we have a connect card in the back. We'd love to meet you. We also have a QR code on the screen if you want to scan that. If you have any prayer requests, um, we would love to believe in faith with you. Whatever is going on in your life, it's confidential. We get our prayer team together weekly and pray over these things. But we're just so glad to have you here with us. And even those who are joining us live online uh, this morning on YouTube, we welcome you and thank you uh, for joining us wherever you're watching from, uh, from local or around the world. We're delighted that you would spend your Sunday morning uh, here with us. Well, welcome to Capital City Church. My name is Blaise Riculli. I'm the senior lead pastor um, here at this amazing, amazing church that doesn't take one or two people, but takes a community that comes together to see the name of Jesus glorified in our city. Amen. And I just want to honor for a second all of our serve team that makes every Sunday morning happen. And so can we just give a hand clap to everybody that serves every Sunday morning? From the parking lot to the greeting team, to the media team, to everybody that serves in the children's ministry, every hand works together for the good of the kingdom of God. And, and it does not get unnoticed. And maybe I don't tell you enough, but thank you. And I'm proud of you. And thank you for stepping up into the things God's called you to do. Because it takes a team. It takes a community. It takes a church. It takes a togetherness to come and to see a lost city come to find and know Jesus. You have a story to share that maybe I don't. Somebody has a story to share that you've never shared before with somebody. But can I tell you, the power of your testimony could transform an entire region. Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. The power of your story and testimony could clear a hospital out for what God did for you. The power of your testimony can change uh, a ministry. The power of your testimony could, could change the atmosphere in the, in the job, in the workplace that God's called you to just from a simple thankfulness of what Jesus has done in your life. Do you believe that today? We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And so we're so glad to see you all today. Daniel, thank you for leading us into the presence of God. I don't like to say that we're shorthanded sometimes on Sunday mornings, even though if we don't have all the instruments, because we're not shorthanded in the presence of God. Amen. No matter there's one, three, or five people on the stage, whether we have a guitar or a piano or the drums, one, two, or three singers, no matter who's up here, the presence of God always shows up when the church comes together Amen. to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so I'm excited for what God's going to continue to do today as we step into our next uh, part of the service into the reading of the Word of God. And if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me for just a moment to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Uh, last week, we talked about a together generation, part one, and this morning, we have part two, as I promised, and I've promised that uh, in the past to do a part two, and I've changed it, but today, I'm sticking to it. Say, I'm sticking to it. I'm sticking to it. And last week, um, I, I, I released the word that I felt like God had given um, us as a church for the month of August, um, and I heard the Lord say that this month would be an acceleration month for our church and Amen. that can look you know many different ways that can look like you know spiritually you know we're stepping into something it can look physically as we continue to grow um, into this house that God's called us to but I truly felt like August would be an acceleration month how many know that with acceleration sometimes there's opposition Sometimes when you, when you get in the car and you need to go somewhere, you have to stop a few times, but you will get to the destination that you need to get to. Right. 
You will keep moving forward. You still have gas in the tank, and you're going to move forward into what God's called you to do, and you're going to step into the word that he has for your life. So I heard that for August, that this month would be an acceleration month. And then I heard for the fall season, September, October, November, December. And in Texas, you know, there's not really many seasons. It just feels like it's hot all the time or cold all the time. So we could talk about seasons, but sometimes those seasons change. We'll get summer in the middle of winter. We'll get winter in the middle of summer. We'll get fall in the middle of spring. And just it just gets confusing sometimes. I'm from California, so have mercy on me. But I felt like this fall was going to be the fire fall that the Lord would send the fire into our midst, that the Lord would refine things in our lives, that the Lord would would do something that, that we've been believing God for for a long time, that he would literally consume us with more of him as we seek his face. So August, acceleration, say acceleration. And then the fall, say fire. Fire fall. And I'm not going to sing that song this morning. Are you there? First Corinthians chapter 12. There say amen. Amen. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. And I read this text last week, so I'm just going to catch this up. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not part of the body because I am not an eye, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require the special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is part of it. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. God, I thank you that it is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light to guide our path. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come and sweep in the room like we've been praying for all week. Would you come and give us a glimpse of heaven even greater than the time of worship, Lord? We, we just believe this morning that you would minister to us through your holy word. God, let the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you rest upon every heart in every mind in this place. God, even as we minister unto you, Lord, I thank you that healing and deliverance begins to happen in the middle of the message. Holy Spirit, let your word fully overtake what we have to say to listen to what you truly have for us today. So would you come today? Our hearts are clean before you. And would you do what only you can do in this place? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. A together generation part two. When we think of the word together, sometimes that can feel like a very uncomfortable word. Like, well, I have to do something with somebody. I've been used to doing this by myself for a long time. And maybe you're you're an introvert or an extrovert. And I know there's different personalities going around our world. But can I tell you? Maybe this, is, maybe this is true or not, but I believe that if you're living in the family of God, you aren't an introvert, but an extrovert because you have Jesus living on the inside of you. That's right. I don't ever want to adopt the identity of what Christ has placed inside of me to do what he's called me to do, even if that means being out of my comfort zone. Now, listen, 
There's things in our life to where we have to do things by ourselves, and we have to make decisions that God calls us to. But there's also a generation that God is calling to bring things together for the sake of people that do not yet know him. I believe that he's bringing generations together from old to middle age to young, as we talked about last week. He's bringing generations together to see a city saved, to see a nation transformed by the power of God. He's crossing the bridge. He's he's bringing uh, things and people together to make sure that his church is ready for the harvest and that which is to come. So when you hear that word together, sometimes it can feel uncomfortable, especially if you're used to doing something by yourself, but that's okay because the Bible says that two is better than one. And God's design for the church is to be a place of belonging, togetherness, and multiplication of generational blessing. As we read about one body, many parts, same spirit. Let's say that together so we could have it in us. Say one body. Many parts, parts. same spirit. spirit. Now say this, I'm doing this. this. Now look at your neighbor and say, we're doing this. Now look at your other neighbor and say, we're doing this. Now look at the people behind you and say, we're doing this. If there's nobody sitting behind you, shout to the person in the back of the room and say, we're doing this. You see what that does? You see what that does for a minute? You take the focus off what you see in front of you. And you begin to look around to say, hey, we're doing this. We're doing this. I didn't know you were sitting there. We're doing this. I now have a new friend. There's nobody back here, but I now have a new friend. We're doing this. You see what that does? You see how it just begins to break down uh, territories, how it begins to unify hearts, how it begins to go from I, 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 me, me, me into we're. We are. How can we do this together? How can we advance the kingdom of God together? How can I take away what I've always known and and maybe lay some things aside for a little bit to pick up another idea, to pick up another blessing along the way to bridge the gap for what God wants to speak? I believe God is saying, how can I fully maximize my body to reach this generation for the kingdom of God. How can I maximize the body of Christ for the people to fully reach who I've called them to reach? As I said in the beginning, it wasn't part of my notes of just how different parts of the ministry function and how God's placed people in this house for such a time as this that serve in different areas and how we even have the, 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 the different ministry gifts and, and, and the different positions and offices of the ministry. But there's something about when the people of God come together to serve one purpose and to keep the main thing the main thing, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen. As I said last week, sometimes we begin to overcomplicate things and we and we don't keep things simple. The gospel is simple and powerful. That's right. We can have all these things, but if it doesn't come back to the simplicity of the gospel, of who Jesus is and what he's called us to do and how he wants us to reach the harvest in this hour for the sake of the kingdom of God, everything else could be just a simple distraction. But I believe today God wants to bring the generation together. He wants to bring the church together for what's coming. In this room for what's coming in this city for what's coming that that is about to happen next. God's bringing our hearts together for what he wants to do in this next season of life. But first, we have to be together. We have to be together. Would you turn with me in your Bibles this morning to 2 Corinthians 3.18? 2 Corinthians 3.18. And I'll read that in just a moment. My first point this morning is transformation, transformation. The Holy Spirit transforms us. The word transformation means a thorough or dramatic change in form or appearance. I'll say that again. And 
A thorough or dramatic change in form or appearance. I know we have some people in here who have been transformed by God. We have two people. Awesome. Who's been transformed by God? Come on. That's a holy roar in this place. Can I tell you that more people want to see your hand when you walk out of these doors that you've been transformed by God? Yeah, come on. Because that excitement and that passion begins to stir an atmosphere of faith. Amen. You walk into your job, I've been transformed by God. And people look at you like, what? But I guarantee you that there will be a couple people that walk in and say, wow, I can relate to that too. Hey, you've been transformed by God. I've been transformed by God. Where do you go to church? This is where I go to church. What do you do on Tuesday nights? This is what I do on Tuesday nights. I've been transformed by God. What has God done in your life? This is what God's done in my life. God healed you from cancer. He healed me from cancer. He healed my mom from cancer. Whatever it might be, God wants to use the togetherness of the generations by the transformative power of God to unite his church in this hour. God wants to use your story of transformation. 2 Corinthians 3.18, we there? And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory. Say ever increasing glory. Which comes from the Lord. I'm in a loud church today. I like this family. Which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. Here we go. Transformation is continuous. Continuous. We are being transformed into what? His likeness with ever increasing glory. We go from glory to glory to glory, to glory. Transformation does not just stop with one encounter with God. Transformation does not stop when you just say yes to Jesus. We begin to be changed in his likeness. We begin to be molded into who he's called us to be. We begin to go from here to here to here. If we're not continuously being transformed by the power of God, are we truly in his word and spending time with him as he wants? Come on, family. He's a good father. He says, come to me. Come, come, come. I want all of you, not some of you. I want your heart. I want your surrender. I want your body. I want your mind. I want your emotions. I want everything. Allow me to transform you today. Ever increasing glory. If you wake up tomorrow and say, I don't know what my purpose is today. Say, my purpose is to be ever increasing in the glory of God. My purpose is to go into his likeness, into his image, and go from here to here to here. That I'm not even going to be the same person that I was last Sunday morning, even though God met me. Do we have enough in us to believe for that this morning? That's right. As we behold the glory of God, we are continually made more and more like him by his spirit. Family, we become what we behold. If we behold the things that this world has to offer, we will start to become like them. We'll start to become like it. If we behold things in our life and addictions in our life and and maybe alcohol in our life or or things that have been tripping us up for years, if we begin to behold those things, you will become those things. Oh, I'm just going to take a sip today. I haven't in five years or ever in my life. It's not going to hurt anything. I'm at a wedding. It's not going to do. Five weeks later, how did I get addicted to this? How did I now stumble into this? Can I tell you that sin is tricky? But can I tell you that the transformation of God is not? Sin can trip you up all day long. But transformation is continuous. And so if you start to behold the things that, that you think are so innocent, that are worldly, those are the things that the enemy creeps in to take your joy, 
to rob you of your blessing, to destroy your family, to pull you into a pit in a cave of isolation. Those things the devil will use. But if we become more like Jesus, if we behold him more and more, we will see his glory in our life. Ever increasing. That's his word. You can be increasing in something else that the world has to offer. Can I tell you that's going to leave you flat on your face? It's going to leave you hopeless in the middle of the night. That's going to give you anxiety. That's going to give you sleepless nights. It's just not worth it. There's things in this life that are just not worth it. It's not. Nothing worldly is guaranteed to increase. The increase comes when we decrease our selfish ways. John 3.30 says this, he must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. He becomes great in us when we become less in the flesh. What doesn't happen in us cannot happen through us. Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. His transformation is perfect. And can I tell you, his transformation might not might not be the way that you thought it was going to go. But his transformation is perfect. You might get transformed, here we go, in the middle of a church service, and all of a sudden you're sitting on the floor. And you never guess that you'd be sitting on the floor in a church service. But his transformation is good. His transformation is how he wanted it to go. I have a funny story for you. This just came to my mind. uh, I have a family member. He's an incredible evangelist, awesome preacher. I look to him just so much. I I honor him. And there was years and years ago where he was preaching at a church in West Texas. And he was standing on the stage, and there was revival in here. And this was one of the biggest churches in in that city. And he's standing on the stage, and I think service had been going on for about three hours. And he's standing on the stage, and he's talking to his brother, and he's saying, you know, hey, I I feel God leading me to that person in the back. And there's, you know, there's hundreds of people in this room, and and people are just giving everything to the Lord. And it is a powerful service, as he described. And he's wild. You have to go with me here. But I tell you, God's transformation is so different. He's standing on the stage of this church. And the Holy Spirit tells him, I need you to go back there. In his words, body slam this guy. And he looks at his brother. He said, Mark, you can't do that. You can't do that. He said, I heard the Lord say it. Now, in this definition of what he said, he went to the back. And literally, the guy hit the ground, and he was on the ground. I don't have video footage of this, but it could have been a scene. Body slammed the guy. The guy was on the ground for about an hour and a half, and he's thinking, oh, God, I did something wrong. And everybody had cleared the building by this point, and the guy's still on the ground. Obviously, he's still breathing. Praise God. And he gets up. I'm not going to body slam nobody in here today. But he gets up. He gets up. And he said, I told God on my way to church, you're going to have to knock me down for me to believe in you. Come on. That's good. Big old Texan, probably six foot five with a cowboy hat and cowboy boots. He told God, you're going to have to knock me down for me to believe in you. That service, he got knocked down. Come on. That service, he hit the deck. And he got up and he thanked my family member. He thanked him for obeying God. And can I tell you, it feels crazy sometimes. But your transformation might look different from how God wants you to transform. 
What he has for you is far beyond what we could ever believe. And I believe even now that God is calling the comfortability of Christianity, of breaking the box of how we've always thought things should look, of how we've always envisioned church to go, to say, I'm calling a church to be supernatural. I'm calling a church to maybe get out of their seat and to walk around a little bit, to dance a little bit, to stand up, to say, this house is not mine. This house is God's. And I believe that the transforming power of God is going to do something in this hour to bring the harvest in because we cannot go to what we used to be. We cannot put old wineskin into new wineskin. That's what he's doing in this hour. Y'all are loud this morning. I felt it coming in. But I'm telling you, when you begin to change your thoughts, Jesus begins to transform you. And you begin to change your life, family. The battlefield is right here in our mind. The battlefield is right here in what we begin to think. Then we begin to say, and what's in our heart we begin to say. And now, all of a sudden, we've, we've lost the transforming power of God because we've given in to the lies of the enemy. We've given in to what he's had to say rather than what God has had to say. What we think could take five years, God has the ability to do in five minutes. Oh, I've seen it before. Come on, that's something to praise about. I've seen it over and over again. What we think could take five years, God says, I just need five minutes. I just need 10 seconds of praise. I just need a holy church to come to the altar to say, this is not my life. This life is yours, God. That's all it takes. He is the God of the suddenly. We know that scripture in Acts 16, Paul and Silas in the prison cell, and they begin to sing praises and songs and spiritual songs to the Lord, and, and the chains begin to break and the prison doors flung open. Right. It, just te- it just took a song at midnight. Come on. That's right. That's right. It just took a sound from heaven. Amen. It just took a couple people saying, I'm going to believe for this transformation. Amen. I'm going to believe Amen. for this breakthrough. This is not for me. This is for those coming after me. This is for the generation that is yet to be saved. Number two, we take a notes, relate, relate with each other through godly relationships. Hebrews 10, 19. If you have your Bibles, would you turn there quick this morning? Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, I'm going to read. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 10, 19. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Woo. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right in. Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. Just a little sprinkle. Just a little sprinkle of his blood to make us clean. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. So let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together. That's what we're doing here today. Let us not neglect this right here. As some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I'm going to read that verse one more time because it's so powerful to get in our spirit. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. Why? Who doesn't want to go to church? But encourage one another, especially now, especially now, that the day of his return is drawing near. We don't have time to waste, family. We don't have time to waste for what God's doing in this hour through the global church. I almost sense the Lord saying this morning, don't worry about what things used to be in your life. 
Don't get weighted down by what once was, but have enough faith to believe that what will be will far exceed what you've ever been through in your life. Amen. That's the story. That's the testimony. That's the transformation. That's what God relates to with you for where you're going. I believe sometimes it could, the things of, of our past, of what we've had maybe with, with, with church or we've had with relationships, even as I was worshiping this morning, I felt like the Lord said that I'm healing broken hearts today. Amen. That I'm healing broken hearts. However, that's affected you in your life. But can I tell you that the Bible says that he is near to the brokenhearted. He is near to you. He is near to comfort you. He is near to strengthen you. He is near to pick you up and place your feet on solid ground once again. He is near to you today. We have relationship with one another because of the blood of Jesus. I believe that the church and the world are in a major spiritual battle over righteous living, over godly relationships, over what's right and what's wrong, over good and evil, over life and death. And I believe that there's a major spiritual battle even over our children and the unborn. There's a major spiritual battle happening, and we as the body of Christ are standing, I tell you what, we're standing at the front lines. Right. Yeah. And even those who are in ministry and called to ministry and even pastors, I've, I've talked to just this last week saying that we're in a major spiritual battle right now. We're in a major spiritual battle. What do you need? How can I pray for you? The devil's walking around trying to disrupt things. If he can disrupt his church, he's going to disrupt a lot of things. Because he's already disrupted the world. He's already confused the world. The, the world thinks right and wrong, good and evil, life and death. But if he can confuse the church, my gosh. The warriors need to arise. It's a sound cry. It's something that lifts us up to say, I'm not going to let this happen anymore on my watch. As a believer, as a son, as a daughter of God, saying this isn't going to happen in my generation. I'm not going to let what happened before happen again, and I'm not going to let it happen again after me. So we have a choice as a church to get hammered down by the enemy or to say, I'm giving a holy hush to the enemy and I'm saying, stop it right now. We're moving forward. That's what God's doing in the earth. I know it's heavy stuff, but the cross was heavier. The cross was heavier when Jesus went to Calvary. The blood was enough for us. The veil was torn. We have a great high priest singing over us today. With authority. Matthew 25, 40 says, Whatever you do for the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. When we do life together, Trust is built within the core values of who we are as people and who we are as a church. Can I remind you that what we do for each other is not really for each other, but it's unto the Lord. Because if, if each other are part of the family of God and if we are sons and daughters of God, we are actually doing it unto the Lord. And the word we like to say around here a lot is a faith word. We like to say yet, yet. Even those who are yet have come into the family of God. Those who have yet received their healing. Those who have yet been restored to life by the power of God. We truly believe that that faith word together will make an ultimate impact for eternity. Amen. That's right. Praise God. 
Jesus spent three years teaching and building relationships with the 12 disciples. It was just 12 men who responded to the call. They were simple men who gave up everything. They weren't scholars. They were just ordinary people. I don't know about you. I'm just an ordinary guy. But can I tell you at the end of the day that they fanned the flame of the gospel. They took it to the ends of the earth. When we fan the flame of the gospel, impossible things begin to happen. We begin to see our lives transform. We begin to see relationships uh, formed, relationships healed. When we, when we put the blood of Jesus at the center, things begin to change. When, when I come to church, I believe Jesus is looking for the hungry ones. He's looking for the desperate ones to reach out from the crowd and touch his robe. To say, Father, I need you right now to intervene. Lord, whatever, whatever it is in my life, the, the, the relationship that I first have with you, but even the relationships that you want to form through me to advance the kingdom of God. And I believe that even as I'm standing in this room this morning, that there's people here that God is going to put on your hearts to reach out to and say, hey, there's a family waiting for you. There's relationships waiting for you on the other side of your yes, on the other side of your obedience. That Jesus wants to take what he's placed in you and give it out to others. Amen. He wants to form something so beautiful and so powerful that takes, that takes one relationship to five, to six, to ten, to twenty. You have no idea, church, what God's placed in you. Amen. You have no idea. If this morning you get anything out of this, just say, Pastor said to wake up and do what God's called him to do. Do what God's called you to do. Almost like a little pep talk this morning. Like, come on, let's go. Let's do this. We're in a together generation that God wants to bridge the gap in and through us. Number three, revive. Somebody say revive. Revive, revive through the word of God. The word revives us. Hallelujah. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. That word revive means making alive, keeping alive, and giving more life. Woo. Lord, revive me. Make me alive. Lord, revive me. Keep me alive. Lord, revive me. Give me more life. Psalm 119 talks about the word revive 11 times. It is also the largest chapter in the Bible with 176 verses. If you want to go read it, go home and read it. 176 verses. But in verse 37, David reminds us to turn our eyes from looking at vanity. Meaning pride or admiration of one's own appearance. Or achievements. My prayer is that God would revive us by his word. As Charles Spurgeon says, we have nothing to do with this vain world. We are not citizens of this world. Amen. That word revive changes us, but only if we're in his word. Yeah, that's right. The Lord said that he would revive us by his word. He said that he would revive us by his promise, that he would revive us in his ways, that he would revive us through his righteousness, that he would revive us according to his loving kindness, that he would revive us according to his ordinances. I find it significant that verse 1 starts with joyful are people. That's verse 1 of 119. Joyful are people. And as I was reading... I looked at verse 176, and it ends with, I have wandered away like a lost sheep. Come and find me. But it says, for I have not forgotten your commands. So I start joyful. Joyful are the people. But I've wandered away like a lost sheep. Come and find me, Lord. <laughs> Come and find me. But here's, here's what I have to say. I've not forgotten your commands. Maybe you're at verse 1 right now, and you're in the middle right now. You're in the middle of 1 and 176, 
And you're praying, God, revive me. Revive me according to your ways. Revive me according to your arches. Revive me according to your loving kindness. Revive, revive, revive me. Lord, I started this journey with you joyful. I started this journey with you when I said yes, full of faith, full of hunger, full of passion. I started here, but Lord, I began to slow down in my life. I've wandered away like a lost sheep. But would you come and find me? For I have not forgotten your commands. Maybe you're at that verse of the chapter of your life right now. Maybe you're at that moment where you said, Lord, I've wandered, but I've not forgotten your commands. Maybe this is your first time in church in a long time or first time ever. Maybe you have the word in you, but you're just saying, I want to come back this morning. Can I tell you that the commands and the word of the Lord are in you today when you said yes to Jesus? And if you've wandered, he's saying, just come on back home. Come on back home. Reviving you first becomes contagious and brings people together. Daily revival that we have as individuals with God in our own time with him in our, as we call the secret place with God, when it's just you and him in your home or you and him in that time that you devote to him daily to say, Lord, this is my own personal revival. That happens through the word, through prayer, through intimacy with God. But corporate revival brings people together because of lives transformed by the power of God. That's why I love when we come together and we worship and we're in a place and an atmosphere of faith. Your faith could get me through the faith I need this morning. My faith could help you get the faith you need for tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday for whatever you have coming up in your week. Our faith comes together for the same purpose, and that is to see Jesus lifted high. And so if we have corporate revival, we begin to say, Lord, my life is now revived by you. But now I'm coming into an atmosphere of faith to where this is going to be a corporate revival. I love when we get loud and crazy because it shows of the testimony of God of what he's done in our lives all week long. Can I tell you that it brings transformation, that it brings the power of God when people come in this church that do new, who do not yet know him, that when people step in here, that their lives are a complete mess. Things begin to transform because we've first been transformed, because we've first been revived. God meets us in that place. My last point this morning, number four, repent. Repent. It means to turn away from sin. Repentance is a change in how you think that leads to a change in how you live. Acts chapter 2 verse 36 says, So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you to your children and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. This generation is crooked. But because we live in this generation, we don't have to accept what the enemy tries to label over this generation. We call this generation redeemed. We call this generation set free. We call this generation righteous. We call this generation saved. We call this generation holy living. It says, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believe what Peter said were baptized and were added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. Imagine for a second, 3,000 people being added to the church. Does it seem strange that Peter said repent 
instead of believe, he said, repent, repent. Repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. We have to repent as believers. When we came to Jesus, when we confessed him as the Lord of our lives, we repented of our sins. Can I tell you, repentance takes great humility. Repentance takes great humility to say, this is what Jesus did for me. And no matter what situation I'm going to, I must repent. I must come under the mighty right hand of God that is filled with victory, that is filled with power, that is filled with understanding. I have to take a stance of humility, even if you might be the right person in the wrong situation. Sometimes we have to repent and come low and say, God, you only do what you can do from here on out. Both of these things, repentance and faith, they're two sides of the same coin, but both are essential for salvation, and each is dependent upon the other. I think it's awesome that good things happen after repentance. Very good things, as we read about in Acts 2. It says that you'll receive the Holy Spirit after you repent. You'll receive a touch from Him. It's a promise to you and your children To those who are even far away, you repent, you begin to set the stage for your children to walk in repentance. You begin to to be a, a light and an encouragement to those who are so far gone, who are so far away from God. People begin to see your life as humble, as holy is righteous before the eyes of not only man, but most importantly, before the eyes of God. Amen. Daniel, would you please close me out this morning? Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, if you want to turn there one last time. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. You all getting anything out of this today? Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Second Peter 3, 9 says the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. If you are holding off on a decision for Christ until you think that you are ready or worthy, then you are waiting in vain. If you are waiting on a decision until you think, oh, yeah, I'll be ready then, or, you know, I'll feel a little more worthy then, you're waiting in vain. God's saying, now's the time to repent. Now's the time to not hold any unforgiveness. Now's the time to allow salvation to hit your home, to hit your family. Now's the time. As we talked about how this generation could simply be so crooked, we have the ability by the power and the word of God to say, no, this generation is going to be transformed because I've been transformed. I think of people like Billy Graham who led millions of people to Christ. But one man, whom probably nobody knows, led him to Christ first. And I believe it was in just some little small church on the East Coast, I could be getting these facts wrong. Somebody was obedient to lead Billy to Christ. Can I tell you? Salvation is not insignificant by number. Whether it's one or a hundred or two hundred or two thousand. Salvation is eternity at hand. That God wants everybody to come back home to him. And I think of that moment with Billy, it could have just been him in the room. 
or he could have been one of a hundred. But what could have maybe seemed not that significant, oh, we just had one today. No, it's significant. Because you don't know what's on the other side of that yes of obedience. You don't know what's on the other side of that transformative power of God. Amen. Would you stand with me to your feet this morning? That transformation brings the breakthrough that God wants to use in and through your life. Jesus is ready to receive you right now, family. He's ready to receive you. And we like to say, come as you are here. No matter your mess, God wants to turn it into something so victorious. No matter what you've gone through this week, Jesus wants to clean you up. He told me one time, he said, Blaze, he said, don't, don't clean yourself up and then come to me. He said, come to me and then I will clean you up. Hallelujah. Would you lift your hands this morning? Father, we come before you today asking for a holy touch from your spirit. We thank you today for the transformation of the power of God through the Holy Spirit. We thank you today that we will relate with the kingdom of God because the kingdom has been placed inside of us. We thank you today that we would be revived by your word. God, we repent of our sin. Forgive the church for not preaching more on repentance. You said in your word, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, that if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, and then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Father, we thank you for who you are today. Would you come, Jesus? I thank you for a church that you've called together from all different parts of this city. No matter the distance, no matter the drive. I thank you in advance for what you're assembling in the spirit. I thank you in advance for being the glue that holds us together. Jesus, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, would you, would you pull us in this morning? If there's anybody here today that's on the edge of fully surrendering and giving their life to Jesus, this is your moment today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, there's nobody looking around. But today, if you've come in this place and you've said, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life and I want to surrender fully to him. My life has been crazy recently and I just want to give it all to the Lord. If that's you, would you just simply raise your hand high where I can see it this morning? Would you raise your hand high where I can see it? I see you. I see you. I see you. Hands across the room. Now, church, would you begin to pray? Would you begin to pray for every person in this place? Would you begin to bless the Lord? Would you begin to stir up an atmosphere of faith? Would you begin to, to, to pray for, for strongholds to be broken? Would you begin to pray for breakthrough? Would you begin to pray for healing? Would you begin to pray for restoration? Would you begin to, to pray that, that nothing would be impossible for God in this place? Would you begin to just bless Him right now for just a few moments? Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. 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 We bless you. We bless you. We bless you. We bless you. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you, we bless you, we bless you. 
If your hand is raised, I want to lead us in a prayer. Would you say this out loud with me? Would you say, Father, I give you this day. I thank you for bringing me here to this church. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin, for my shame, for my wickedness. And I believe that you rose again on the third day to give me life. Jesus, I repent of my sin. I turn from my old ways. And I believe today, as I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you are who you say that you are, that my life would never be the same. I surrender my heart. I surrender my dreams. I surrender my purposes for the sake of knowing you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for salvation that's come to this house today. We thank you for life.